gives me great pleasure to introduce to you for a few comments the President of the Catholic Rural Life, uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop Dingman. Bishop? Mr. Chairman, delegates, and guests. When I was a country boy on the farm in southeast Iowa, I guess I never dreamt that one day I would be in this position addressing an NFO convention. But I do look back to those days when I worked on my father's farm, and one of my great boasts is that I built the best straw stacks in the community. And the way my father tested the straw stacks that I built was when I came home from college at Christmas and we opened up the straw stack. If it hadn't leaked up to that point, then it was a good straw stack. I represent at this moment the Catholic Rural Life Conference of the United States, and I am the Bishop President. We are very much concerned about the agricultural scene and have been for many years. The budget of the Catholic Rural Life Conference is around $150,000 each year. And so we are active in many different areas. You've just heard Sister Annette, and she is part of the five-person staff that we have at the headquarters in Des Moines. Our hope is that we can bring to bear upon the agricultural scene the teachings of the church. I would like to just mention a couple of names that I think are important as we think back to our traditions and as we look forward to the future. I suppose the name that is perhaps the most important and has had the greatest international influence is the name of Pope John the 23rd. He wrote an encyclical letter not too many years ago, and it was concerned with family farms. It was concerned with the progress of peoples. And in that document, he stressed the importance of what you are all about. In that document on, called Mater et Magistra, he said that it is important in the field of agriculture that we have professional associations. And he says it is very necessary that there be these associations in which farmers will join together to reap the kind of results that, that they hope for and that the real solution to the farm problems is for farmers themselves to organize cooperatively, collectively, and to achieve their rights in our society. It has been a long time in coming, and I like the headline that I see in the NFO reporter it's time for collective bargaining. Ideas are great, and we know that concepts are important, but sometimes those concepts don't work effectively. There's a time for the idea. Perhaps this is the time when collective bargaining can begin to be effective on the American scene. It's time for a concept promoted by Pope John XXIII back in the 1960s 
Fifteen years ago, he wrote this encyclical. His ideas are just as valid now as they were then, but somehow they didn't catch on. Perhaps this is the time for the idea of collective bargaining to catch the attention of American agriculture. Perhaps this is the time when our hopes and our dreams can be achieved. I'd like to mention another name that is very meaningful to many of us, and that's the name of Monsignor Liguti. Last July, we invited him to come back from his residence in Rome, where he is retired, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of his ordination to the priesthood. And Monsignor Liguti did come back, even though he was 82 years of age. And he did celebrate his anniversary. And he gave a, a, a new feeling to our people as he visited with them and again stressed many of the ideals that he has stressed through the years. And Monsignor Liguti has given impetus to agriculture and has exercised a, a leadership that we will perhaps never fully appreciate. And so it is to Monsignor Liguti that we, that we look these days and say, what he has been talking about through these many years, perhaps this is the time when his ideas will come to fruition. There are many difficult steps ahead. It's not an easy task that we face. We know that farmers are traditionally independent, that they exercise their own good judgment and that's one of the glories of being a farmer, is that you have this kind of, of possibility of taking individual initiative. But I think the time has come for us to, to think of ourselves as a great community. The time has come for us to merge our, our efforts. We cannot do it alone. It's necessary that we work together in a community spirit it seems to me that this is one of the functions in which a church can give leadership. There's a moral issue involved. And there is then, it seems to me, on the part of the church, an opportunity to speak to those moral issues, to reason with the farm community, and to ask them to come to grips with this problem and to give up that independence insofar as it's necessary and to see a beautiful balance in the life of a farmer, a balance between that individual independence that he has and yet the necessity to work together with his fellow man for those goals which cannot be accomplished alone. We often put it in terms of two principles, the principle of subsidiarity and the principle of consolidarity. The principle of subsidiarity to be as independent as possible at the lowest possible level, and yet to balance that with the principle of consolidarity, where we must join together in those issues and for those things which we cannot accomplish alone. And so we must look at our problems from those two points of view. And it seems to me that the church can do much to bring a new thinking, a, a new kind of consciousness and awareness of what we must do in order to achieve our goals so that we can indeed work together for the welfare of the total, of the whole. I appreciate this opportunity to say these few words to you. I will be here during the entire convention, and nothing would please me more than to have an opportunity to meet as many of you as possible. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman.
great pleasure to introduce a distinguished gentleman who has had a great impact on the state of Nebraska and great influence throughout the nation. Nebraska is rightfully proud. The man that I'm going to introduce, one that I consider a personal friend, and one that seeks advice from every source of information that he can get to try to make the right decisions. The man that is governor of the state of Nebraska and one that I'm sure that we're going to hear more and more about in the years to come and having a national impact with his forthright righteousness, his forthright dissertations on whatever might be the subjects that need to be discussed, keeping well informed and always looking out for the benefit of average John Doe American. It gives me great privilege to introduce to the delegate body the Honorable Governor, Governor Jim Exon, Governor of Nebraska. Jim, great to have you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lee Staley, thank you very, very much for those kind, kind words of introduction. And it is a real honor for me to be here today to be one of the opening speakers on your convention. This is the first time that we have had the opportunity in Nebraska to host the national convention of the National Farmers Organization. And I'm certainly pleased and was highly honored that I received an invitation to come here and give you a welcome. Also to discuss with you some of the thoughts and some of the ideas that I think we should be pursuing. And for me to get from you to hear once again the strong and the effective voice that the National Farmers Organization has always been in the interests of and for the family farming operations of these United States. I, I had an opportunity to visit with several of my Nebraska friends on the way up to this podium. And I also see and have met also a few people from some other states. And I, as I look around this room, I see that there are indeed many states represented. And as I understand it, the weather has delayed some who are continuing to come to Omaha, Nebraska. To you out-of-state people, those outside the borders of Nebraska, I certainly want to welcome you here to this national convention. And I also want to welcome you to football country USA. Uh, Nebraskans obviously have the majority and anything important should be voted on not right now, Orrin Lee. It is football country USA, and of course we're tremendously proud of that. Now we, we're so delighted that, uh, that we're going to a bowl game uh, again this year. Uh, we, uh, we had a choice in Nebraska this year. We had the choice of either going to the Orange Bowl in Miami, Florida on January 1st, or to the Liberty Bowl in Memphis, Tennessee on uh, the 19th day of December. Uh, we looked at that very carefully, uh, made our game plan for that last game of the regular season against Oklahoma. And while some people think that Nebraska was forced out of its game plan down there, that's not the fact at all. We had made a determination that we had uh, gone to the Orange Bowl on several occasions. Uh, we had come away from that bowl on several occasions with victory. 
And we felt that it was only fair that under the circumstances that we accept for the first time it was offered to us, the Liberty Bowl invitation at Memphis, Tennessee, and therefore the Nebraska football team went down to Oklahoma with that in mind. Now, I explained that in the same detail that I have just explained it to you to all those Okies that I had to sit around a week ago Friday down in Oklahoma. They didn't believe me, and obviously you don't either, so we'll, <coughs> we'll go on with something else. Before we leave football, though, I, I did want to tell you that, uh, you know, we have a great rivalry in Nebraska football with Oklahoma and many other schools, but that one with Oklahoma has gone on for a long, long time, and it's a high-class relationship. I just wish we could beat them a little more often. But anyway, we enjoy being defeated if we have to be defeated by class, and of course there is class in Oklahoma. I told them uh, after the game down there that once again we recognize that uh, through oil money, the people of Oklahoma had the best football team that money could buy, and we, we appreciated that. I told them that in making our plan for next year that they shouldn't relax or let down because the coach is already talking about introducing a new offense called the Veer offense to make better use of some of our excellent running backs. He was also talking about some other changes that I said could pose a threat when you, Oklahoma, come up to Nebraska next year for that annual game, and we recognize and agree already that once again, Oklahoma will have the best football team that money can buy. But we have one other thing that we're planning on next year and maybe counting on. While Oklahoma will undoubtedly have the best football team that money can buy, we are going to try and arrange it so that we can have the best officials that money can buy. <laughs> and we kind of think that that might even things up just, just a little bit in that annual battle with our friends from the South. Speaking seriously and getting away from football and into the real important matters that you're here to discuss at this convention. We Nebraskans are very honored to host the national convention of such a great, great organization. My hearty welcome is exceeded only by my best and enthusiastic wishes for your continued health and success in the interests of the family farmer and his children and his wife and the community in which he lives. It's good to be back, and I'm proud to be here among the displayers of the green and the white, where I have been many times before. Thank you again for your invitation. For seven years as governor of a major food producing state, I have devoted nearly as much time to promoting sound agricultural policies as I have to exercising my executive duties. That is as it should be, because the past, the present, and most importantly, the future of Nebraska and her sister states in the great, great breadbasket of the world are tied directly to agriculture. If it glows, we grow. As chairman of the National Governors Association Subcommittee on Agriculture, I have been the lead governor spokesman in this vital area and the developer of the nation's governor's policy on agriculture. And we have done some positive things. In addition to passing resolutions, in addition, addition to testifying before the committees of the House and the Senate, we have come up with constructive policies designed to help agriculture. One of the last things that was accomplished, it wasn't enough, but it was something. It was governors in action. Last March 29th, as chairman of the Subcommittee on Agriculture for the National Governors Association, I met with President Carter and Secretary of Agriculture Bob Berglund during the time that they were thinking and planning <coughs> for the farm program. I told the President and the Secretary of Agriculture at that time that we just couldn't wait. 
I explained to them that two days after I was there, the present sign-up time for wheat would expire. And I suggested that the administration extend for 60 days, the time when the wheat producers could sign up for loans. They agreed to that, and it was certainly a fine thing for the wheat producers because, as you know, that was during a time when wheat was skidding most rapidly in price. The administration agreed to that. They also agreed to a second problem, to, to, to some uh, cures for an upcoming problem that I called to their attention for the first time there. We knew at that time that we were facing huge crops for the 1977 crop year. And we didn't know where we were going to store that. And I suggested to the President and the Secretary of Agriculture at that time that it would be wise for them to take steps immediately to liberalize the loan and down payment requirements for on-farm storage facilities for your grain. That was done. And thirdly, at that particular conference, I called to the attention of the President of the United States. And he told me that that's the first time that he'd ever heard it, that there was an extreme credit crunch in rural America. At that time, he directed the Secretary of Agriculture to do an in-depth study of exactly what the credit situation was and a report that came out showing the critical situation and proving it had something to do with the raising of the support prices in the farm bill. It wasn't enough. What, what, the only reason I am citing these is the fact that each of you in your individual states must realize and recognize and use the strong right arm that your governor can be to you in the development of and the pushing through of sound agricultural policy. A healthy agriculture, a prosperous country, to this end, we are sincerely dedicated. That NFO motto says it all very well. Those are our goals, but we're not there now. I appreciate the opportunity to give you some of my suggestions and hope that you will agree that they are constructive and that they're positive to reach those goals. I will detain you for only 18 minutes. First and foremost, it should be recognized that the fundamental concepts of the NFO, collective bargaining, and a strong, unafraid, and unrelenting positive voice for agriculture are no longer revolutionary, but accepted. <laughs> Your pioneering efforts are to be saluted, recognized, and appreciated. I know that it has not been easy. But when you accomplish something, it never is. Accomplish something, you might ask, what have we accomplished when we still see prices generally below the cost of production? That is what some of the negative soothsayers might say. But the NFO has set the pace, and your perseverance has set the stage for results that must come and are bound to come. When you started it all, when you started it all, who would have envisioned that in December 1977 there would be an effective wife organization, a National Strike Incorporated movement, or an American agriculture organization promoting a farm strike in order to raise prices? The seeds of activism for farmers doing things for themselves collectively, was planted and cultivated by the National Farmers Organization.
your fertile seeds of constructive, nonviolent, positive action for agriculture, sown inside and blown by the winds of change even outside your organization, are taking root. It is good. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Members of the NFO, you have sown well, and I am confident that all agriculture is about to reap in the form of fair prices. Some members of the older farm organizations, and you're included in that now, who have labored for so long and so hard, look a little askance at the new kids on the block. That's natural too, but in the end, it's good. Too many farm organizations, too many ideas, maybe, but I honestly don't think so. You see, the fierce independence is the nature of the beautiful beast or brute that we call agriculture. And every one of you sitting in this room today recognize that fully. You show me three farmers, and I'll show you three ways best to move the bull from the barnyard to the cow pasture. And then about that time, there would be a fourth one that would rush up who would join in the argument, syringe in hand, suggesting that we not move the bull at all, but to kill him. And so it goes. Unless my memory fails me, I think there may have been some disagreement once or twice, even in the National Farmers Organization. <clears throat> The important thing to remember is that out of discussion comes action and a sense of direction towards some common goals that will produce a healthy agriculture, a prosperous country. Our efforts are being realized. Our salesmanship is beginning to pay off. In a statewide poll in Nebraska released last week, it was clearly shown that we are finally getting through with our message that agriculture and the family-sized farm needs help. A full 70 percent of Nebraskans, farmers and non-farmers alike, support a program whereby the federal government would guarantee at least all costs of production for agriculture. This is an amazing increase in the approval of that concept, whether you totally agree with it or not. And certainly any kind of an approval rating for anything like that was foreign indeed when the NFO started a few years ago. I want to encourage you. You're getting somewhere. Keep plugging away. I have explained previously to your state convention my concept to bring permanent health and stability to our vital food producing plant. I predict again that we will eventually come to some sort of a national policy that I call a federal food and fiber board that would do for agriculture what the Federal Reserve Board has done for this nation's banking industry. The government-backed and created Federal Reserve Board and its affiliated systems have all but eliminated bankruptcies in banking, protected the users, and assured financial well-being to the investors. And most importantly of all, it has maintained the free enterprise system in that industry. 
and they make a profit. What is the matter with a similar successful program for our number one industry, agriculture? My suggestion for such a system for agriculture, as you will remember, entails a plan to bring parity of resources earnings to agriculture enjoyed by business and industry in general. Without a long-range policy, we are going to face periods of boom and bust that leaves the family farm producer winging it on a hope and a prayer. But that is another chapter of another story that must await solution to our more immediate problems of rampaging increases in production costs and low prices, decreasing prices in farmland, some of it mortgaged up to the hilt, skyrocketing farm borrowings at high Please turn the tape over to side number two for continuation of the speeches. The United States Department of Agriculture reports that in 1977 this year, so these are current figures, that for the first time in history, the farmer will receive less for his food producing efforts than labor who processes the food. Actually, the farmer the producer of all of it, will receive only 31 cents, the labor processor 33 cents, and the transporter and merchandiser and other costs 36 cents of every dollar spent on food this year. It's easy to see who is getting the short end of the stick. It's less than a third for the producer. And I'll bet those who blame food price increases on the farmers have no conception of this basic fact. We've got to tell it to them. That does not mean, in my opinion, and some do not agree with me on this, and some in this room won't agree with me on this, but I say what I think. This does not mean that agriculture should rush out and attack the workers who process, transport, and sell the food that the farmer produces. Irresponsible political soothsayers have been practicing that for years. Those people, you see, know what they, their services, and investments are worth in the marketplace. The question is, do we in agriculture? Part of the trouble, and I suggest a very important part of the trouble, has been that agriculture itself has been trapped into accepting a cheap food policy. A cheap food policy assures only one thing, cheap raw products. And that's all that we have to sell in agriculture. I criticize again the present farm legislation as I have from the beginning of the proposal for failing to meet at least the cost of production. I certainly make no apology for this to anyone, although I have been criticized previously for such stands by those non-farm interests who maintain that government should stay completely out of agriculture. Now, when we talk about the government staying completely out of agriculture, I do not think that we are being realistic under the conditions that we face today. Yes, if we could ever bring the ideas fostered by the National Farmers Organization from the beginning, collective bargaining, and make it work, then we can get the government out of agriculture. But realistically, looking at it today, that is not the situation. To the contrary, under present situations, we should employ the obvious advantages that government offers to improve the whole scope of what can be done on a positive basis for agriculture. Foreign governments all over the world 
are actively engaged in helping their important food producers. Forty-five days ago, Pat and I were in Switzerland at the invitation of the Swiss American Association with five other governors and their wives. One morning, we had breakfast with the agricultural attache attached to the State Department, and you see even since that time, the State Department wants to cut down on the number of agricultural attaches, which are more important, in my opinion, in representing our interests over there than most of the diplomats, but they want to get rid of the agricultural attaches. We had breakfast one morning with our agricultural attache in Bern, Switzerland. And he told me about why we're having difficulty importing agricultural products into Switzerland and the European common market countries. What do you think the Swiss government is guaranteeing their food producers for a bushel of wheat? You know, granted, Switzerland isn't a big wheat producer, but they produce a lot of wheat. And they eat all that they produce, and they import some. What do you think it is? You'd never guess, $11 a bushel. In the European common market countries, the government is guaranteeing or subsidizing wheat, depending on the country, between $5.50 and $6.50 a bushel. Now, that's why when I hear people say, get government out of agriculture and it'll work, over half of the wheat, somewhere between 60 and 65%, has to be sold overseas. A half of our corn and half of our soybeans. When you have government policies like those that I have just cited around this world of ours, where they keep our products out of there to protect their local producers, is it any wonder that we find our markets overseas lacking from time to time? One thing that we have got to do is start leveling with the food producers in this nation and tell them the story as it is, rather than the way some people would like to have it. There is a myth today, it's a partial myth, but a substantial myth, that you out there are operating in a free market. You're not operating in a free market when a large group of people in the world represented in Europe are going to make it really impossible for you to sell wheat into that country because they are protective of, they're protective of their domestic producers. And God bless them for that. That's not wrong. One of the problems that's most serious is the fact that it's time that we, interested in agriculture, get the message across loud and clear to our representatives in Congress, to our United States Senators, to the Secretary of Agriculture, and to the President of the United States who ultimately makes the decision. And that is to tell them that we can start to cure the problem. If we get the Department of State completely out of and away from having anything to do with agricultural policy. It is my position until we get things straightened out, that the federal farm program should be based at least on a reasonable floor on minimum prices, figuring all costs of production, including labor, management, depreciation on equipment, interest, and use of land. And then let us use the tools that we have at hand to raise that above that so that we can return to profit in agriculture.
The first step, it seems to me, is to reach that plateau which we are short of with the present farm program. If we could first accomplish such a goal, we would at least guarantee that our family farms would not be going bankrupt with continuing net losses year after year. Our next goal, and it's a continuing goal working simultaneously, then should be to keep up our continuing pressure to obtain 100 percent of parity or more. Parity is not the maximum. We should be talking parity or more as quickly as possible, which I think can be accomplished with a nine-point combination of actions, including one, more aggressive salesmanship of farm products domestically and overseas. Two, elimination of our traditional cheap food policy and effective spokesmen and spokeswomen to tell the proud story of American agriculture. Three, liberalize government loan policies to assist orderly marketing by farmers of their production. Four, tightening labeling and inspections on meat imports. Five, bartering for oil and fertilizers by farm organizations like the NFO, farmer co-ops, or even government representing farmers under certain restrictions. Six, pressure from WIFE, the farm strike movement, the established farm organization, political leaders, and others. Seven, enforcement of prohibition of the widespread short-selling techniques employed on the Chicago Board of Trade to the detriment of the family farm operator. <clears throat> Eight, development of Nebraska's gas hall program. And nine, demand implementation of the optional tentative proposed 10 percent set-aside program for corn and feed grains with amendment of the Farm Act to provide at least a $2.50 target price for corn and comparative upward adjustment for other feed grains. Otherwise, there is little chance that the program will be used since the bill's target price of $2.10 for corn is simply too low. If we can insist on the establishment of a farm program based on an assured floor to cover all costs of production, simultaneously develop a plan to use or properly manage temporary surpluses of production, and employ the tools of sound management and promotions that I have outlined, then the continued operation of the free enterprise system on individual choices to reach and exceed 100 percent of parity is in the long-range best interest of the family-sized farm. In closing, let me say that I have been tremendously proud of your accomplishments and our communications over the years. My door is always wide open to your suggestions as one of your servants in the interests of agriculture. And it is entirely proper that we continue to work together to this end to which we are jointly dedicated. Again, to all of you, a hearty welcome. Have a great convention and a safe trip back home. Thank you all. Thank you.
national capital, Charles Frazier. Chuck. Very good. Greetings. It's very nice to be back to see you again this year. I sometimes have the feeling that the one thing we bring you when we come out to the Middle West to each of these national conventions is a good cold snap. But I think considering Milwaukee last year, it's going to warm up around here very soon now. Devon, members of the board, staff, good friends in the NFO, it really is a pleasure to be back with you. And before I proceed any farther, I should like to introduce our legislative assistant in the Washington office. She's my partner. She's a good family back at home. We persuade her to leave them once a year and come out here to work with those of you in the Resolutions Committee. And otherwise, I'd just like for her to stand up. Ann Bornstein from the Washington office. Ann? Well, there's been enough going on in the farm front lately. You can well imagine we got quite a number of phone calls these days from reporters, friends scattered around different places over the country asking what's up out in the farming world, what's all the noise about, what's going on with those farmers. One of the reporters called the other day, and he said, well, how many farmers are there now? And I said, no one knows, but some of us are pretty sure that we're down to a half million and we're dropping every day. The next question he asked me, he said, well, how do you define a farmer in these days? And I said, I don't know that I can define one, but I'll tell you this much. Someone advised me that there's no one else that is so close to God and so far from the telephone. Of course, the next guy came along and wanted to tell me how to run the office, and I need a lot of advice. So I asked him about definitions. And I said, well, how do you see the political scene today? There's a little interest in it. People out in the country want to know, and I've got to go out and see them. The guy said, well, he said, if I were you, I'd give up trying to identify things by parties. He said, I know you operate in a bipartisan manner. But he said, you might think of them this way. Why don't you just talk to them about liberals and conservatives? And I said, yeah, you define one of those for me. He said, well, I'll give you a good guide. He said, a fellow fell in the Potomac River down here the other day, was looking for some help, and he really was having a hard time because he didn't know how to swim. So the first guy that popped out of a car and offered to help him could be defined as a conservative. Now, you see, this guy was out in the water about 50 feet, and it was cold, and he was having a real rough time. The conservative ran back to the car, and he got a rope. He held on to one end, and he threw it out. It was only about 25 feet long. And he said, now, you got to help yourself. you got to come the first 25 feet on your own. Well, the guy went under about twice. He wasn't getting along very well, so he gave up on that one. And about that time, a second guy came running out of a car. He was going to be helpful. He had a rope also. So he grabbed up his rope like you would an old lariat, and he hauled off, and he threw it out to the guy. And of course, it was about 100 feet long. The only thing is, he let go of both ends of the rope, threw the whole thing to him, and ran off down the road to do some more good. Well, to do this quickly, let me just try to summarize the year for you. As you very well can imagine, we worked the first half of the year on the farm bill. There's some of you that think it's terrible. I won't come out here and tell you that it's wonderful, but I can tell you this. It was a long, hard fight. We did get some higher price supports than we had before we went into it. It is now applicable to all the planted acreage for the participants next year rather than the old limited allotment acreage. And there are some provisions that we think will help you. We continued the emergency provision for those of you who just went through the drought period out here. There was roughly $650 million put out under it last year. It's extended for another couple of years. 
The reason I mention that is to lead to the next subject for those of you who are in drought areas or flood areas. The next, one of the next little rounds in the legislative battle back in Washington is the reworking of the crop insurance program. A number of people with good intentions in the administration have proposed and will be working with the Congress on an overhaul of what we've known as the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation now for several years. They're going to try to make it a little more reasonable on the rates and make it available on all the major commodities in all the major producing counties. Now, I just bring it to your attention now. We will be working on it. Some of us know that if we pick this up as a new program a couple of years from now, it will replace the present disaster provision in the farm program. And we all know that we don't like to take those payments. But if you lose a whole crop, it has been some source of relief out here in the drought areas. It is one you can watch. We'll try to keep you up in the reporter. You can follow it over the next few months. It'll be worked in the first part of the next congressional session. A second one that's underway, and unfortunately this is of interest to some of our members a little more now than it would have been a year ago, and that's some change in the Farmers Home Administration loan setup. The proposal that's getting the most attention in the congressional committees at this stage of the game would increase the maximum amount of money that can be loaned to FHA borrowers on both ownership loans and operational loans. And unfortunately, unless we can stop it, they will probably put the source of money on the New York money market and we will lose that 5% ownership loan that has been worth something to some of our younger borrowers, some of our younger farmers. We've taken the position in our office that if they want to change this program, we think two things should be done. One, make more money available out in these offices so some of our borrowers can get loans without waiting 12 or 18 months for them. And secondly, we want to keep the lower interest rates. If you feel any differently about it, let us know. Now we've been involved with ice cream standards, inspection procedures on imported farm products, and as of some of you who've worked in the resolutions committee with us and so on, you know that we've consistently taken the attitude that all imported food products ought to stand the same inspections and the same standards as our own products undergo right here in our own packing houses, creameries, and so on. This continues to be our position in Washington. It's going to be tough to handle. It costs more money, but it is tied in with the efforts that will be made to get honest labeling on some of these food products, and we think we'll have, well, we'll say a little better shot at it this coming year than we've had up to this time. Now, following such a good speaker as Devon Woodland, I do not expect to uh, compete, should we say, but I would like to visit with you for just a moment about two or three thoughts on where we may be going in agriculture. It is true the national debt's been going up. It is true the dollar is sliding in international trade again. I think it's equally true it's going to be as tough as ever to find the answer in Washington to the problem of pricing these farm products. Having worked on it so many years, I am not particularly proud to come out here and tell you that 
We cannot get the whole answer in Washington. So I hope you understand that when I talk to you about farm program provisions and crop insurance and FHA, and when we work with the other organizations back in Washington on some of these problems, we're working on them always with the understanding that they are the stopgap measures, they're the safeguard, if you please, against even worse disaster in pricing farm products, and all of the time we know that we either have to be successful in farm bargaining and price our own products, or we're not going to make it. That's the attitude that we follow in our office. In fact, I was reminded a little article in the newspaper the other day, all of us were brought up out here on these farms to have some ambition and believe we could accomplish something in life. I noticed one of the farmers quoted by an Eastern reporter when they asked him about his success in farming, competing under the current costs of operation. And he said as a young fellow, he set out with the ambition to be worth a million dollars. And he was pretty sure he could make it. He was doing all right three or four years ago when grain prices were up. And unfortunately, though, he discovered they could go down just as fast as they could go up, and he was cut off. He would never get to a million because he found out that all he could borrow was a half million. <laughs> and that leads me to just a final bit of advice. We're going to be plugging away back there on some of these bills that are up. And we appreciate the support and the help that we get from you at the state and district level in working with politicians in the Congress. We have to have some liaison and some cooperation. We have to be in touch with them. They have to know us if we're going to be influential with them. And in that spirit, I think we can well draw up a couple of other little guidelines while we're working to build NFO membership and advance the bargaining on these farm products. My friends, I think it might be a pretty good time to cut back on the borrowings if we can possibly do it, to cut back on the fertilizer bill, the chemicals bill. Let's draw in and sit down tight on it and hang on as hard as we can and see if we can get some of this grain moved abroad and see if we can take the actions that hold onto these farms until bargaining can bring back the better price. I don't think this is the time to get exuberant and try to buy the piece of land away from the guy from the city or something of that sort. This is the time to buckle down and stay tight in the saddle. It's still going to be rough for another while. Thank you so much. Thank you.